you won't find William Henry Harrison on anybody's list of favorite presidents. It's not that he was incompetent or particularly disliked. It's just that he wasn't president for very long. He was president for only 30 days. The day of his inauguration, March 4, 1841, was rainy and cold. Harrison had been a war hero. He was now much older, but he didn't want people thinking that politics had made him soft. So he delivered his inaugural address without a coat or a hat. And boy, was it an address. He spoke for nearly two hours. It's the longest inaugural address in American history. Aren't you glad I don't talk that long during chapel? <laughs> so the president who delivered the longest inaugural address became the president who served the shortest time. The moral of the story, if you want to serve a long and happy presidency, keep your speeches short. <laughs> king Ahaziah, second kings, had his term as king of the northern kingdom of Israel cut short. The moral of his story is very different. He didn't deliver any long speeches, at least not that are recorded anywhere in the Bible, but he did consult a God other than the God of Israel. Anytime we seek salvation from anywhere other than God, it will surely lead to disaster. Now which God exactly he consulted is not known. The Bible calls him bel Zebub. You'll remember from yesterday the Hebrew word Bel is actually a generic term that means Lord. So Belzebub means Lord of the Flies. Now the people of Ekron probably didn't call their god Lord of the Flies. Most biblical scholars agree that this is probably the writer of 2 Kings poking fun at Beelzebul, which means Lord of Glory. The name Beelzebul is also used in the New Testament. And you'll see on the handout that I gave you, I have a list of the verses where you find that name in the New Testament. I don't have time to look at all of those with you right now, so you've got them on your handout if this is something that you want to study more in your own time. Those are verses you can look up. But I'm just going to look at one of those passages, and it's Matthew 12, 22 through 28. And it says, Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him, so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do our people drive them out? So then, they will be, our, be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Each time Beelzebul is used in the New Testament, it is referring to Satan. Since the Philistine city of Ekron called their god Beelzebul, and the Philistines were the enemy of the Israelites, the Jews came to use the name Beelzebul as a nickname for Satan. Like the religion of Israel and many of the ancient Near Eastern cultures, Canaanite religion involved sacrifices. They had sacrifices prescribed for specific situations. If you do this or you want this to happen, then sacrifice this kind of animal this kind of time. They also had regular sacrifices that happened at the same time every year. We found records of um, sacrifices that would last days or sometimes even months. So they would have to come back and continue every day for a long period of time to complete the ritual. They also had things that had more practical applications, just like um, witch doctors and tribal cultures today serve you know, sometimes practical um, purposes. They had spells that get rid of snake bites, the hill snake bites. And they've even discovered a recipe to ease a hangover that the priest would make if that was needed. The Canaanites also practiced something called divination. Divination is when you try to obtain an answer to a question or learn of the future through mystical or spiritual means. Kind of like a magic eight ball or a palm reader. When Ahaziah has a question in 2 Kings 1, he sends messengers to the Philistine city of Ekron and he's probably sending them to consult with the diviners there in Philistine. 
in Ekron. The Philistine diviners there in Ekron. Diviners had books and manuals in which they could look up certain events and see what would happen or find the answer to the question. And the entries in these books usually took the form of, if such and such is true, then this or that would happen. For example, if a man's chest hair curls upward, then he will become a slave. And that's an actual thing that would have been in their manuals. We have found, you know, um, that they've done archaeological digs, and one of the manuals they found, that was one of the things, you know, so. They had a long list of things like that. That's just one example. That's an actual example from that time. It was believed that the gods maintained order in the universe. If something was out of order, if it was different, it was taken as a message from the gods. Because of this, diviners meticulously study nature, and especially animal and human organs. They wanted to know what a normal heart or liver looked like so that they could spot abnormalities, they could spot differences. Clay models of organs that diviners <coughs> used have been discovered. And you'll see a picture there on your handout that is a clay model that was found in, a, it's a Babylonian clay model that's been discovered by archaeologists of a liver. Although diviners didn't realize it, their careful study of organs would lead to the modern sciences of anatomy and medicine. They were, you know, already taking careful study of to know how everything worked inside, what it was supposed to look like if it was healthy. And just as a consequence, um, kind of like alchemy led to chemistry, some of the stuff that they studied did more, you know, lead later on to actual sciences like anatomy and medicine. A person seeking guidance from divination would usually present a priest with an animal to sacrifice. They would split the animal open and they would use the entrails and the organs following these models that they have looking for anything that was different or out of the ordinary to tell them what the answer to their question was or the future. A priest uh, also inspected malformed human and animal fetuses for signs and omens, and also the positions of stars and other heavenly bodies were used to divine the future. God had promised the land of Canaan to the Israelites, and after they escaped from Egypt, which we saw in our very first day of chapel, they sojourned through the desert, and then they entered the land of Canaan. And there were already many different peoples living in the land of Canaan. And God warned the Israelites not to follow the ways of the people already learning, living there, not to do the things that they were doing. And we see that in Deuteronomy 18. And starting in verse 9, it says, When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, or consults with the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord, and because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out these nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. Divination was a common practice in Canaan and throughout the ancient Near East. And this was the area that the Israelites were moving into. But God warned them as they were going in, just because all the other people there do it, I don't want you doing it too. Ahaziah was not the first Israelite king to seek guidance to divination. King Saul did it too in 1 Samuel 28. And Saul even knew that divination was wrong. Earlier in his reign, in 1 Samuel 28, verse 3, it says that Saul had expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. So he knew it was wrong, and he had even kicked the people out that it was doing those kind of things. But now he was facing a terrible battle, and he had sought God's guidance. And in verses 4 through 7, the Philistines assembled and came and set up camp at Shunem. While well, Saul gathered all Israel and set up camp at Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him. By dreams, or Urim, or prophets. Saul then said to his attendants, Find me a woman who is a medium, so I may go and inquire of her. There is one in Endor, they said. God wasn't answering Saul, because Saul did not have a right relationship with God. Saul had the medium conjure the dead prophet Samuel, and through the medium, Samuel told Saul, the Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David. 
because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites. The Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will deliver both Israel and you into the land of the Phil hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. You may remember from a few days ago how that battle turned out with Saul's head in Dagon's temple. Ahaziah was the son of Ahab, who we talked about yesterday. And the showdown between God and Baal on Mount Carmel, it was because Ahab and his wife Jezebel, who was a foreigner, she was one of the people of the land that was already worshiping God, that God had warned them against. He married her and adopted her god Baal, and they started worshiping Baal there in the northern kingdom. And because of that, we had already seen God come into confrontation with Baal in chapel yesterday. Ahaziah didn't learn from his father's mistakes. Second Kings starts with him sending messengers to consult with a pagan god. Ahab had given both of his sons names honoring Yahweh. Ahaziah, his son who becomes king here, means Yahweh has grasped. And it's meaning here, you know, that Yahweh has, you know, pulled us away or grasped us from danger. He's protecting us. He had another son, his name was Jehoram, and that name means that Yahweh is exalted. Maybe Ahab thought that even though he brought Baal into the land of Israel, he could still worship Yahweh, that he could worship both alongside each other. But it doesn't work that way. God told them that's not acceptable, that they are to have no other gods before beside him. And so looking at Ahaziah's story in 2 Kings in the very first chapter, and really the story of 2 Kings continues without a break from 1 Kings. Now Ahaziah had fallen through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria and injured himself. So he sent messengers saying to them, Go and consult Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, to see if I will recover from this injury. After becoming king, Ahaziah falls out of a window, badly injuring himself. How a king falls out of a window, the text does not say. Well-known Bible scholar and radio commentator J. Vernon McGee, he is dead now, but he went through the whole Bible on the radio, and those messages still play on radio stations today. And when he was talking about this passage, when he was going through the Bible, he suggested that Ahaziah was maybe drunk. He got in a party, got drunk, was messing around, and falls out of a window. But even um, Vernon McGee says, this is just a guess, because the Bible doesn't tell us. All we know is this king falls out of a window somehow and badly injures himself. Maybe he saw a mouse. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> that guess is as good as saying he was drunk, because the Bible really does not say We don't have anything other than the Bible telling this story. Ahaziah sends messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron whether he will recover or not. Ekron was within the five cities of the Philistine Patapolis that we mentioned last week. Ekron is actually one of the Philistine cities that um, archaeologists haven't covered. It's an area we now call Tel Mikni, and they began excavating this area in 1981, and even at this time some of the archaeologists thought that it could be Ekron. Then in 1996 they discovered an an inscription with the name Ekron actually on it that confirmed for most of the archaeologists that this site that they had found was the Philistine city of Ekron. Ekron was the largest producer of olive oil in the ancient Near East, and there is evidence of a widespread olive oil processing industry there. And so, these weren't even Israelites. These were Philistines. We know um, they were enemies to the Israelites most of the time. This is a foreign god that he sent his men to consult with. And in verses 3 and 4, but the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and ask them, Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going off to consult Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Therefore, this is what the Lord says, You will not leave the bed you are lying on. You will certainly die. So Elijah went. The messengers, re the messengers returned without continuing on to Ekron, it appears. Because in verse 5 it says, When the messengers returned to the king, he asked them, Why have you come back? So evidently they had come back before doing what he had said. And they came back immediately to tell him the message that uh, Elijah had given them. A man came to meet us, they replied. And he said to us, Go back to the king who sent you and tell him, 
This is what the Lord says. Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending messengers to consult Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Therefore you will not leave the bed you are lying on. You will certainly die. The king asked them, What kind of man was it who came to meet you and told you this? They replied, He had a garment of hair and had a leather belt around his waist. The king said, That was Elijah the Tishbite. <laughs> this description was distinctive enough. A garment of hair sounds uncomfortable, so I'm guessing that was a fashion that didn't catch on, that Ahaziah knew immediately who this man was. It was the prophet Elijah who both his father and mother had many run-ins with. His mother Jezebel many times even tried to kill Elijah. Uh, continuing on in verse 9, it says, Then he sent to Elijah a captain with his company of fifty men. The captain went up to Elijah, who was sitting on the top of a hill, and said to him, Man of God, the king says, come down. Elijah answered the captain, If I am a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty men. Then fire fell from heaven and consumed the captain and his men. At this the king sent to Elijah another captain with his fifty men. The captain said to him, Man of God, this is what the king says, Come down at once. If I am a man of God, Elijah replied, May fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty men. Then the fire of God fell from heaven and consumed him and his fifty men. Ahaziah's men were probably starting to feel like redshirts from Star Trek just about now. I wouldn't want to be the one that the king calls on next to say, Hey, go get Elijah. But he sends another one. He's undeterred here. So the king sent a third captain with his fifty men. The third captain went up and fell on his knees before Elijah. Man of God, he begged, please have respect for my life and the lives of these fifty men, your servants. See, fire has fallen from heaven and consumed the first two captains and all their men, but now have respect for my life. <coughs> the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him. Do not be afraid of him. And why would Elijah might have been afraid of the king? Well, the king's mother had tried to kill Elijah. Why? So if I was Elijah, I would think that maybe he was trying to do the same thing. But the angel tells him in this Third captain of the fifty men, don't be scared, go to the king. So Elijah got up and went down with him to the king. He told the king, this is what the Lord says. Is it because there is no God in Israel for you to consult, that you have sent messengers to consult Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Because you have done this, you will never leave the bed you are lying on. You will certainly die. So he died, according to the word of the Lord that Elijah had spoken. Because he hadn't had a son yet, Ahaziah's brother, and we'd already talked about him, what his name meant, Jehoram, becomes king. That's where this story ends in 2 Kings. He becomes king, falls out of a window, and dies. His whole reign as king barely takes one chapter of 2 Kings to recount. It's not much more than became president, delivered a long speech, and died. Ahaziah served a little longer than William Henry Harrison, his reign lasted about two years, but he didn't accomplish much more. In fact, Ahaziah is mentioned in only two other passages in the Bible, 1 Kings 22, 48 and 49, and 2 Chronicles 20, 35 and 37. And I'll go ahead and quickly read those two passages. In 1 Kings it says, Now Jehoshaphat built a fleet of trading ships to go to Ophir for gold. But they never set sail. They were wrecked at Azion Gabor. At that time, Ahaziah, son of Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, Let my men sell with yours. But Jehoshaphat refused. And then the one in 1 Chronicles says, Later, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, made an alliance with Ahaziah, king of Israel, whose ways were wicked. He agreed with him to construct a fleet of trading ships. After these were built at Edion Geber, Eliezer, son of Dodavahu of Merashah, prophesied against Joseph at saying, Because you have made an alliance with Ahaziah, the Lord will destroy what you have made. The ships were wrecked and were not able to set sail to trade. From these two passages, which are clearly telling the same story, the order of events isn't quite clear. 
But what's going on here is Jehoshaphat, who was king of the southern kingdom at the same time of Ahaziah of Judah, because Israel had split into two kingdoms at this time. There's the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And the pattern that we see, this isn't always true, but generally, the northern kingdom was wicked and followed other gods, and the southern kingdom was true to the one true God and followed him. And this is the case with Jehoshaphat. The Bible even says in 1 Kings that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. But at this time, they were at peace with the two kingdoms. The two kingdoms were fighting. So I'm sure he thought, you know, what would it hurt to work together, to partner in this? Um, so he was building ships to send to Africa. That's where the Ophir is that it's um, referring to. And he was going to send things that they had to trade for gold that they had in Africa and to bring that gold back. But because, you know, even though he was a good king, because he was partnering with a wicked king with Ahaziah, those ships crashed, and they weren't able to make it to Africa. And then it seems, you know, from the other passage that maybe he built more ships or planned another mission, and Ahaziah asked again, and he said, absolutely not this time. He had learned his lesson, you know, not to partner with people that weren't following the one true God and were worshiping other gods, because God would not bless that endeavor. Ahaziah and Jehoram had names honoring Yahweh, yet neither actually honored Yahweh. You can't call yourself a Christian and then act like the rest of the world. Maybe when naming them, Ahab thought he can continue worshiping Yahweh alongside Baal. But it doesn't work like that. God wants your total devotion. And so we've looked here at the showdown, and we're moving here to see what we can learn about God from the showdown. And I've got a few um, sentences there you can fill in the blanks. You can't follow both God and the world. Christianity isn't just about spending your Sundays different. It's about spending your life differently. When you give your life to God, you give your whole life to Him. He begins changing you from the inside out to be more like Him. We're incomplete. God made us to worship Him, but because of sin, we're separated from Him. When Jesus extends the offer, offer of salvation to you, he offers to complete you. When you hold back a part of your life and don't let Jesus come in and transform it, you are leaving yourself incomplete. So you've become a Christian, but you want, don't want to give up those friends that you used to get into trouble with. You're holding something back. Or maybe it's the music that you used to listen to. You know it doesn't worship God, but you've collected so much, um, so much of it and you enjoy listening to it. And so you're holding something back. Satan doesn't want you to make a difference. Uh, but, you know, give it to God. Unless you want to end up like a hazmat. No, I don't mean dead. But what legacy did he leave? He was in a position of power. He was the king. And what is he remembered for? He fell out of a window and died. You can make a difference, but the world will try to hold you back. Whatever you're holding on to, whatever you don't want to give up, it's holding you back from the purpose God has for you. Give it to God and let Him complete you. On your handout, I have Deuteronomy 18.9 printed there. And we looked at that as where God was warning the Israelites not to do the things that the people already in the land were doing. And 18.9 says, When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Do not imitate the world. Uh, and right there under the verse, I have another um, phrase you can fill out. God calls you to be different from the world. You are to be a witness to the world. When other people look at you, they should see Jesus in you. That Ouija board in your friend's closet may seem harmless. What's it going to hurt to go into the fortune teller's tent at the fair or to call one of those psychic hotlines? You may want to check out your horoscope in the newspaper. God has called the church to be different from the world. If the church starts doing the same things that the world does, you won't be able to distinguish between the two. There's probably nothing demonic behind most psychic hotlines. They're probably scams. The person writing the newspaper horoscopes probably gets them off the internet or off the bathroom stall, you know. He's probably not checking out the stars or anything like that. But are you honoring God? And what kind of message are you sending to non-Christians? If she does what I do, why do I need to become a Christian? The church can't compromise doctrine to become, to become more palatable to the world. 
if we begin to accept evolution, what part of the Bible would we be willing to give up next? If we bend our stance that life before birth is precious and should be protected, what's going to stop everything else that makes us different from the world finally fading away? Jehoshaphat was a king who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. But when he allowed himself to become partnered with an evil king, when he allowed himself to be partnered with the world, his um, attempt to go to Africa and trade for gold fell. His witness was weakened. The ships crashed. You cannot become tied to the world. You must be different.